Okay, um, so thanks everyone for joining us uh, in what is the uh, third uh, seminar in the New Directions in Cooperative AI series, uh, which has been run by the Cooperative AI Foundation. Um, so just very quickly before we, before we get started, um, for those who haven't attended um, one of these talks before, um, the kind of idea behind the seminar series uh, is to give um, thinkers the opportunities to present um, their visions and their agendas for uh, what cooperative AI research should look like. So uh, what are the most kind of important questions um, out there and what are, what is, what, you know, what might uh, solutions to those, to those questions look like? Um, and also for them and for us uh, as audience members to um, um, hear from uh, various disciplines um, and get various uh, perspectives and insights from uh, from all sorts of from all sorts of different areas, so that we can start to make progress uh, on some of these on some of these topics. Um, so just before then we start, I will notice I will note um, that we are uh, still accepting um applications so if you're interested uh, in giving a talk in the series we really do encourage you to apply um and you can do so via our website uh, it should be nice and easy to find um and also um if you're interested in uh keeping up to date more generally uh, you can do so via our mailing list via which all the future talks will also be announced okay so with that uh said and done um i will uh yeah without further ado i suppose now now hand over to uh, our speakers. So we have uh, Jesse Clifton and Sammy Martin, who will be speaking on differential progress in cooperative AI motivation and measurement. Um, so Jesse is a researcher at the Center on Long-Term Risk. Uh, he is a, an analyst at the uh, Cooperative AI Foundation and a PhD student at North Carolina State University. Uh, Sammy Martin is a PhD student at the King's and Imperial Center for Doctoral Training on Safe and Trusted AI, and is also an independent researcher uh, working at the Centre on Long-Term Risk as well. Uh, and we're very fortunate to be joined today by two discussants. So first of all, we have Zoe Kramer, who is a PhD student at Oxford uh, and uh, a DPhil scholar there at the Future of Humanity Institute. She's also an affiliated researcher at the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk and the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge. Um, and her research, um, among many other things, is on uh, computational neuroscience, epistemic risk, distributed algorithmic te technology assessments and global catastrophic risk. And then last but not least, uh, we have uh, Jose Hernandez Orayo, uh, who is a, a professor of AI at the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia um, and a senior research fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence and like Zoe, also a research affiliate at the Center for the Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge. Uh, his research, uh, Jose's, is on evaluation and measurement of intelligent systems and in particular machine learning systems and also on applied research in data science, data mining and inductive programming. So uh, with that all said and done, I will now hand over to Jesse and Sammy and thanks very much. And great. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, everyone. I'm excited to be here. Um, Sammy and I will be talking to you about differential progress in cooperative AI. And uh, in due course, it'll hopefully become clear what we mean by differential progress. So uh, the talk is going to be in two parts. I'm going to do the first part um, in which I will introduce this notion of differential progress on cooperative intelligence. Um, and so the problem this is motivated by is that um, capabil multi-agent capabilities, the kinds of capabilities we might, uh, we might train in the course of doing cooperative AI research, overlap with harmful capabilities. So the ability to understand other agents also helps us uh, more effectively deceive them and manipulate them and so on. Um, so for that reason, I'm going to argue that we want differential progress. Um, so roughly, we want much more progress on capabilities that enhance social welfare that tend to make everyone better off than ones that uh, uh, might harm social welfare. Um, and I'll give a few examples of, of what I mean uh, by this. And um, as kind of a segue to Sammy's part of the talk, um, to achieve differential progress, it would be nice to be able to kind of measure it. Uh, to get some measurements to, to have some sense of whether we're actually we're actually making differential progress. And uh, Sammy will talk about um, uh, measuring performance due to cooperative capabilities, which is some early stage work he and I are are working on. Um, and this will 
um, involve uh, telling you about uh, how we are thinking about constructing an uncooperative baseline agent. Um, and the, the, the hope is that comparisons to this baseline agent can give us a sense for um, whether we're making making progress on cooperation in particular. Um, and uh, given the, the agenda setting kind of nature of this uh, seminar series, um, of course, we're, we're presenting this early stage work because we think it's kind of interesting in its own right, but we also hope that it serves as a kind of illustration of how we might um, might go about thinking through some of these thorny issues and in um, uh, and, 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 and the hopes that, you know, uh, folks think about these issues from a, a broader range of perspectives in addition to just the, the one that we present here. And as Lewis said, um, we're going to be putting out a call for proposals soon. The Cooperative AI Foundation is going to be putting out a call for proposals on evaluation. Um, so uh, how do we construct better metrics, uh, definitions, uh, benchmarks, data sets, so that we can have a kind of more rigorous understanding of what our, our agents are doing in the context of cooperative AI. Um, so that's going to be going out in, in the next few weeks. Um, so definitely, if you have any interest in this area, um, keep an eye out for that. Um, we would be keen to get uh, get your your proposals. Okay. Um, with that, I'll, I'll move on to my part of the talk, differential progress on cooperative intelligence. So um, I'll... I'll I'll uh, eventually define what I mean by differential progress, but I'll say some some introductory stuff first. Um, so I guess uh, let's remind ourselves what the goals of of cooperative AI are, um, or at least uh, how they what they seem to me. So the Cooperative AI Foundation's mission is to support research that will improve the cooperative intelligence of advanced AI for the benefit of all humanity. And similarly, uh, Defoe et al. last year in their nature commentary on cooperative AI write that the crucial crises confronting humanity are challenges of cooperation. So they list uh, collective action on climate change, political polarization, misinformation, uh, global public health and other common goods as important challenges that require some kind of cooperative intelligence to solve. In light of recent events, we might add to this list um, international cooperation, maybe cooperation on nuclear nonproliferation um, as additional really uh, serious challenges that um, require some kind of cooperative intelligence. Um, so I think that uh, it's clear that cooperative AI, we, we want the work that we're doing uh, to lead to net increases in social welfare. We want uh, the work that we are, are doing to kind of tend to make the world better off. Um, and uh, uh, this is about uh, this talk is about how some research we might do could inadvertently um, make things worse off by giving agents kind of nasty capabilities in, in the course of trying to make them cooperative. Um, so I've used this word cooperative intelligence a few times, so I might as well try to give a definition. Uh, so this is this is a working definition, um, but. Uh, the, the, the working definition is cooperative intelligence measures an agent's ability to achieve their goals in ways that also promote social welfare in a wide range of environments and with a wide range of other agents. So we want agents that are, that are capable, but that are capable in ways that tend to make uh, other agents better off. Um, and notice that this is chosen to parallel the leg Hooter definition of, of single agent intelligence. And by the way, I, I can't take credit for this uh, alone um, this has been the product of, of conversations with with a few people, um, especially uh, Lewis Hammond, who who just did the uh, the the introduction, Alan Defoe, uh, Jacob Forrester. So um, uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't wish to present this as my my own um, sole contribution. In any case, uh, we have this 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 working definition. Um, so, so by social welfare. Uh, here I mean some measure of the extent to which all of the agents in the environment have their preferences satisfied. So it could be the sum of their utilities, it could be the product of their utilities, um, and the choice of social welfare function itself might be controversial. Um, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to assume that we have some way of measuring social welfare that we're all happy with. Um, and uh, uh, I think there are other uh, other conceptual issues with this definition that need to be ironed out. Um, but I'm just going to leave all of that aside and 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 use this as a kind of um, uh, rough illustration of what we mean by cooperative intelligence for the purposes of the talk. 
Okay. Um, so how does cooperation or cooperative intelligence come apart from other capabilities that AI systems might gain in the course of, of, of us doing AI research? Um, so one problem is that obviously marginal capabilities increases in general don't favor cooperation. So making agents more skilled at, I don't know, building dangerous bombs and, and, and other technology uh, doesn't necessarily favor increases in social welfare. And even uh, even those capabilities that are that do contribute to cooperative intelligence overlap with increase with 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 dangerous capabilities. So they are uh, uh, sort of dual use. Um, and so as some examples of the, this problem, uh, these problems I gave, well, I said, you know, dangerous techno uh, technological capability can be dangerous if it's not directed at mutually beneficial outcomes. Um, understanding other agents better can well, it can help you cooperate with them better, but can also lead to uh, more effective deception and manipulation. Um, better ability to commit to peaceful agreements can lead to better ability to commit to coercive threats. Uh, uh, so again, we have um, a, a dual use uh, capability here. And of course, this is something that we have seen uh, throughout human, uh, human experience. Um, uh, so for instance, we have this, um, uh, in, in this picture is a picture of the phone line that was installed between Washington uh, and the Kremlin after the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, and you know we 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 almost end up with a, a nuclear war, arguably in the Cuban Missile Crisis, and this is 15 odd years into the the Cold War, and only then do we get um, do we get uh, this this exercise of cooperative intelligence to improve communication between uh, Russia and the U.S. So it would, be, it would have been nice if that had happened the other way around. We get uh, we get uh, the relevant kinds of cooperative intelligence before we have uh, you know weapons that are, are risk destroying civilization. Similarly, uh, technological progress, you know, the ability to um, uh, extract energy from fossil fuels is is certainly a kind of capabilities upgrade in many ways, but it also generates um, additional collective action problems around. Uh, well, solving the kind of uh, environmental problems that it creates. Um, so again, it would be nice to have had the um, uh, the cooperative intelligence to um, solve these coll collective action problems as a, as a civilization in place before we had um, these uh, these these uh, dangerous technologies. So those are just some examples, uh, familiar examples of how uh, non-cooperative capabilities can outpace cooperative ones. So we don't want this to happen with AI. Uh, so here are here are two trajectories for AI capabilities, and this is a graph I kind of adapted from Alan Defoe. So credit to him. Um, so here I've, I've plotted two two possible trajectories that AI could take. Um, on on one axis we have cooperative intelligence, on the other we have non-cooperative intelligence. And at some point, uh, AI systems will be superhuman on, on, on one of these axes. And we would like to follow the, the green path. So we would like to have the, uh, so we would like AI systems to be superhuman at, at cooperating before we get um, kind of nasty capabilities that create additional uh, cooperation problems. So we, we would like the proverbial uh, uh, Kremlin White House phone line before we get the proverbial nuclear weapons in the case of AI capabilities. So um, that's all by, uh, by way of saying what we would like as a cooperative AI field, or at least what I, I think we should, we should aim for. Um, now, how do, we, how do we accomplish this? How do we move along the green path instead of the red one? Uh, and this is where finally I'll introduce this idea of differential progress. So um, I think this term is originally due to Bostrom, um, so Bostrom in 2003 says those working for the long-term benefit of humanity should focus on differential technological progress. So instead of uniformly accelerating uh, or, or it, it, contributing to, uh, to, to, to technological progress, focus on those, those technologies that are, are kind of, uh, net beneficial. And in particular, accelerate the implementation of those that ameliorate the hazards posed by other technologies. Um, so in the cooperative AI case, I think that we should focus on developing differentially cooperative capabilities um, for, for our AI systems. And by that, I mean um, capabilities that lead on the current margin to net increases in welfare in a wide variety of environments and with a wide variety of, of other agents. So 
that's a, that's a differentially cooperative capability. And by the way, I say on the current margin because um, given the current uh, given current kind of states of um, AI capabilities overall, um, a marginal capabilities increase could lead to um, could lead to net increases in welfare or, or net decreases in welfare, right? So if you um, if you are kind of highly cooperatively intelligent in, in many other ways, and now you have um, I don't know. Uh, some mechanism by which you can uh, more effectively enforce agreements, then that might uh, kind of lead to uh, increases in welfare in many circumstances. But um, if you are lacking that cooperative intelligence, then you might just end up using that 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 capability to harm other agents or coerce them. Um, but uh, right, so this is what this is what I'm I'm, I'm talking about when I say differentially cooperative capabilities. Um, so how does this apply to contemporary multi-agent AI research, say? So we have this um, very interesting benchmark, a very interesting game, very interesting benchmark environment that's, that some folks have been studying recently, uh, Diplomacy, which is a seven-player zero-sum game. And one of the things that makes Diplomacy interesting is that it requires um, both cooperation and uh, well, non-cooperative capabilities to, to succeed at. So basically you, you play, if you're not familiar with the game, you play as one of the great powers of Europe and you have to conquer a certain amount of territory to win. And uh, you can't conquer territory without allies. So you need to be able to cooperate with allies, but of course you can't win if your allies are still around. Um, so you also have to be able to figure out how to effectively um, backstab um, uh, backstab your, your allies. Um, so the question I want to pose is: Is this a, is this an a, is this an ideal benchmark for uh, studying and encouraging differential progress of the kind that I think we should we should be aiming for? Um, so does this does this benchmark encourage the development of cooperative skills relative to competitive skills? And relatedly, how do we tell the extent to which an agent's performance in diplomacy is due to its cooperative skills? Um, so if you hand me an algorithm, you say this algorithm produces great policies and diplomacy, it beats the state of the art. Um, how can I tell whether this is due to its ability to uh, cooperate, form alliances and, and, and so on versus um, its ability to deceive, manipulate and, and so on? I think it's hard. Um, so I think, um, uh, and, and this is certainly not to denigrate the work well, the work that's being done on diplomacy. Again, I think it's a super interesting benchmark. Um, but when it comes to the goals of, of cooperative AI, um, in particular, I think this is this is not um, not an ideal ideal uh, environment. As an aside, uh, maybe it's not too hard to make it into a good environment for 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 cooperative AI. So maybe it's not too hard to make this into a non-zero sum game where instead of uh, instead of the goal being to prosecute a war against the other players, the goal is now how do we set up an international regime so that we can rationally avoid war. Um, so, um, yeah, may, maybe maybe there's the, we can kind of draw a lot on the work that's being done in this um, in this environment, but also in a way that's more conducive to the goals of cooperative AI. But I'll leave that aside for for now. Um, right. So in in the last in the last few slides, I just want to I, I want to give some examples to illustrate what um, might what might be differentially cooperative capabilities. So I think that. Um, if if folks agree that uh, looking for differential progress is, is is an important goal for the field of cooperative AI, one thing we might do is is try to put together a list of, of differentially cooperative capabilities. So um, I conjecture that some uh, capability is is differentially cooperative, and 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 maybe um, uh, try to try to investigate this in some some simulations or in some game theoretic models and. If I have a hard time coming up with places where this would lead to more harm than good, uh, maybe we add it to the list of, of differentially cooperative capabilities. Um, and back to the, the agenda setting um, um, uh, or kind of research agenda flavor of the, the seminar series, I think this is a nice place where, where lots of different fields can contribute. So psychologists, machine learning researchers, social scientists, and so on, I think will have valuable things to say about um, uh, kind of maybe what capabilities are differentially cooperative. Um, so I'll give a few quick examples of what I, of, of, of conjectures of, of possibly differentially cooperative capabilities. Um, 
So the first one that I, well, the first capability is uh, um, having flexible commitments or, or being able to uh, solve equilibrium selection problems with a wide range of agents. So we know that uh, cooperation can fail because agents have incompatible commitments, or if you like uh, to think in terms of equilibria, they play according to incompatible equilibria. For instance, maybe they have commitments to different notions of fairness. Um, so you and I are in some sense trying to play fairly, but we have different notions of what that means. And so we end up, uh, we end up failing to cooperate. And the simple model of the situation is maybe this game of chicken where I dare, because I think the dare swerve equilibrium is, is, is more fair. Um, and you, you dare because you think that the, uh, that, that you daring and me swerving is more fair. And this, of course, ends up to, uh, causes us to end up crashing. Um, so, uh, I've done a little bit of work on this with some other folks. So in, in a recent paper, we've, uh, introduced this idea of norm adaptiveness. So agents who are norm adaptive are, are, are able to play according to different norms under different circumstances. Um, so they're able to, for instance, reason. Um, or, or we would like to create agents that are able to reason about um, how, for instance, other agents are going to have different notions of fairness, and you're going to be able to, you're going to need to be able to navigate these, these, um, these differences and, and, and find a way to, to coordinate on something if you're going to be able to, to cooperate with a wide variety of agents. Similarly, Vince Conitzer, uh, in, in his own seminar talk in the series, talked about safe Pareto improvements which is a, uh, or at least I think of it as a kind of meta norm for resolving conflicting commitments. So if you have two agents that are initially playing according to different equilibria, they gave a, they gave a particular procedure for um, resolving, uh, resolving these uh, conflicting equilibria. Um, so again, I think that this might be differentially cooperative just because I, I have trouble seeing how, um, how agents could use this to harm, uh, this ability to harm other agents. Um, uh, in the same way that, say, understanding other agents can be used to harm them. Um, but of course, uh, I could certainly be wrong about that. And um, on to the, the next conjecture. So I also think that um, removing biases that impede cooperation might be differentially cooperative. So we know from uh, human psychology that there seem to be some cooperation-specific biases uh, that prevent prevent uh, humans from kind of getting as much as they, they, they could via, via cooperation. So one example is the fixed pie error, uh, which is documented in the negotiation literature. It's the mistaken belief that another's gain is necessarily your loss, um, which of course leads you to forego um, opportunities for joint uh, improvements with other, with, other, with other players. There's also the self-serving bias. So uh, people with the self-serving bias um, make judgments of fairness that are biased in a self-serving way. And of course, this reduces the chances of being able to cooperate with, with other people who may be committing the same uh, bias. And uh, of course, these are, these, are, these are human biases, but they might be recapitulated in AI systems, either because they evolve independently for whatever reasons um, they, they ended up in, in human brains, or they uh, are directly learned from humans um, in, in learning setups that require human feedback. So maybe removing these biases is, is another example of something that kind of leads to strict improvements of in, in, in welfare over many different environments, or at least um, uh, uh, leads to, to much many, many more improvements in welfare than it does uh, welfare losses. Okay, um, so that's, that's kind of one approach we can take to this whole differential progress thing, coming up with specifically differential, differentially uh, cooperative capabilities, but there may be other things. And um, it would be nice to uh, have some way of measuring, um, uh, uh, have some metrics that indicate whether we're making differential progress. And in particular, it would, we would like to be able to measure how good our agents are at cooperating in particular, as opposed to just their overall performance in um, some multi-agent system. And Sammy will now talk about uh, some, some early stage work he and I have been doing on that question. So thanks a lot and, and over to Sammy. I will stop sharing now. Thanks a lot, Jesse. Um, right, uh, assuming you can all see that. So uh, yes, uh, I'll be talking about the problem of measurement. Um, the problem of finding out um, essentially measuring perform the performance uh, of our agents and seeing how much of our agents performance 
is actually due to their cooperative capabilities in order to advance this goal of differential progress on cooperative intelligence. Now, Jesse's already explained why we think differential progress is an important goal, but you might wonder, well, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to measure uh, how much of an agency's performance is because of cooperation? Because as Jesse described, we can at least conjecture and maybe strongly suspect that there's quite a few specific capabilities which seem like they're strongly differentially cooperative. So one option for advancing the differential progress that we want would just be to create a list of the capabilities that we think are differentially cooperative and try our hardest to advance those. But I think just doing that has its problems. While it's clearly a good idea, as an overall research agenda, it doesn't give you the possibility for good feedback loops on if you've actually found enough uh, differentially cooperative capabilities to get differential progress. What we'd really like to do is be able to tell whether or not we're making differential progress on cooperative intelligence which means we'd like to know the extent to which our agent's performance is because of their cooperative capabilities rather than their non-cooperative capabilities. And our rough approach for doing this was, or is, to construct a baseline agent that is good at everything except for cooperating and compare our agent's performance to that baseline. Uh, and in this part of the talk, I'll explain our motivation for this approach and how we plan to make it work in practice. Uh, so yeah, to illustrate why we settled on this approach, I'll first of all uh, sort of provide some examples to show why the obvious seeming solution, which is just looking at the agent's impact on overall welfare, doesn't work, and provide an informal definition of an uncooperative agent that's addressed at the problems raised by just using social welfare, and then sketch a practical uncooperative benchmark agent that's suggested by this definition. I'll also point out that there are other conceptual and methodological difficulties that we'll face in trying to do this, and our approach isn't the only one that researchers can take to this problem of measurement. And at the end of the talk, I'll briefly sketch some alternative ways of measuring how much of a system's performance is due to cooperation that we've only started exploring. But on a problem like this, where do we start? Uh, what we did was we looked at how the performance of AI systems in multi-agent environments is currently measured, which takes us to Melting Pot. Now, Melting Pot is a recent paper that uh, described a method of benchmarking the performance of multi-agent reinforcement learning algorithms. In fact, Joel Lebo discussed it in a previous talk in the seminar series, so I'll just go over it very briefly. But basically what the benchmark does is it provides a set of different multi-agent environments that test uh, different aspects of an agent's capabilities. You train agents uh, in each environment and then having been trained, uh, the agents are exposed to an unseen set of background agents but in the same environment, which tests generalization and gives you a broader way of characterizing the agent's capabilities. Now, <clears throat> For simplicity in this talk, I'll be discussing the case of a single trained agent playing against a single background agent. And uh, also, I'll be discussing uh, these environments in terms of matrix games. Um, all, many, although not all, of these environments are iterated matrix games, but spatially extended in a grid world environment, where the environment essentially provides lots of iterated matrix games against different uh, opponents. Uh, so, uh, if that's how the performance of RL uh, algorithms is currently evaluated. Um, what does this tell us about uh, cooperation? Uh, at first glance, you might think that while um, achieving uh, cooperative capabilities might be quite difficult, measuring how much of an agent's performance is due to cooperation seems like it could be quite easy. It seems like we can just have a look at the impact on overall social welfare. Um, so you measure um, let's say, the sum of the returns of the trained focal and background populations. This I'll note is the utilitarian social welfare, and we're just using it here for simplicity, but as Jesse already mentioned, I believe, um, while this choice of welfare function may be controversial, everything I'm saying here is compatible with using a different social welfare function, uh, and for now we're setting that question aside. So yeah, if you look at, for example, the iterated uh, prisoner's dilemma in the matrix example, which is one of the spatially extended games, the agents that reach cooperate, cooperate in equilibrium, they get high welfare, they did it because they cooperate, and uh, therefore it seems like it's a sign of uh, welfare, of high performance due to cooperation. So if we just go through a wide set of environments and see which agents attain the highest welfare, this tells us which agents are most cooperative. Uh, now, I've already said this doesn't work, but why is that? 
So uh, a simple example demonstrates the problem with this approach. <clears throat> the payoff matrix that I've got here is uh, shows an example of a byproduct mutualism game. And if you're wondering why there's pictures of meerkats here, it's because this payoff matrix is supposed to represent a scenario where two animals in a herd have to decide whether or not to be vigilant against predators. Uh, so obviously being vigilant provides a selfish benefit to the prey animal, but by warning the other animals, it also provides a benefit to them as a byproduct, uh, hence byproduct mutualism. If we were to use a method based on looking at the impact on social welfare, then we would falsely credit reaching the vigilant, vigilant outcome as a demonstrative of an agent, um, an agent's cooperative capabilities when uh, it could well just be an example of non-cooperative intelligence in the the agents just looking out for themselves. Uh, this is the difference between mutualism and cooperation in evolutionary biology. So if that's the deficiency of a social uh, welfare-based method, what's the, uh, what's the way around this problem? Well, one way of restating this problem is that even an agent that has a very low cooperative intelligence uh, would get a high welfare on this mutualism example. So that suggests that to see how much of an agent's performance is actually due to cooperation, mm -hmm. what we need to do is somehow remove the effect of cooperation on the agent's behavior. Now, the more obvious first thought, the most theoretically principled way of dealing with this problem would be to somehow directly remove the effect of cooperative capabilities on the agent's performance. So this would entail presumably using very advanced transparency tools to isolate which parts of the agent's neural network relate to cooperation and shut those off. And uh, what I just described is not technically possible. And in fact, it's maybe even impossible in principle because to separate the cooperative and non-cooperative capabilities of an agent. In many cases, these might even be the same capabilities just applied in different contexts. So, um, if this is a non-starter, what is the alternative? Um, well, the next best thing would be to compare the agent to an uncooperative baseline that we construct. This should roughly be an agent that's good at everything except for cooperating. So um, that's, the, that's the goal uh, then. Uh, construct a baseline agent that's good at everything except cooperating. And ideally, that means this agent should have all of the abilities that might make it perform well in multi-agent settings except cooperative ones and this would have to include some of the things that jesse mentioned in his part of the talk as well if you're dealing with a sufficiently sophisticated environment things like being good at deception and coercion being good at exploiting opponent opponents being able to protect itself and so on uh, or an uncooperative but otherwise competent agent which suggests a way of going about defining it which is to say, define what it means for an agent to be uncooperative, and then among those, pick whatever's closest to a best response to the opponent's policy. Uh, and then doing that will give us a sense of an agent's cooperation specific abilities. And um, for example, this baseline should perform optimally in the byproduct mutualism game and always reach the vigilant, vigilant outcome. Uh, hence, it will address that counterexample. Uh, now, we are working towards a formal definition of cooper cooperation and therefore uncooperativeness that's based on this above idea. Um, but now we're going to focus on the practical baseline so I can get to explaining how we plan to construct the algorithm. Uh, so <clears throat> we can break this uh, uncooperative baseline agent's properties down into it being um, cooperatively incompetent and it having a certain amount of non-cooperative competence, which we can further break down into exploitation behavior and self-preservation safety behavior. So I'll go through these and give some examples so you get an idea of, of what, I, what it is I'm describing. So since it's uh, cooperatively incompetent, the uncooperative agent should uh, learn to play a low welfare equilibrium against uh, opponents where it reaches an equilibrium. So uh, in the stag hunt game, for example, which you can see on the slide, um, we would want to code reaching the gather equilibrium instead of the hunt equilibrium as the uncooperative behavior. Um, but since the agent possesses um, other competencies, uh, it should be able to exploit its opponent. That is, it should be able to increase its own payoffs by reducing its opponent's payoffs. Um, that means at least it should be able to exploit stationary agents. So for example, if its opponent consistently swerves in the uh, chicken game, then the agent should notice that its opponent's doing that and 
you know, adopt the policy of flying straight. Uh, and since, again, the agent is otherwise competent, it can ensure its safety against irrational agents that will harm it at their own expense. So, for example, if it's playing against a min-max opponent that's just irrationally committed to harming it, no matter what, this agent would play uh, maximum. So, uh, the question then is how to turn this into something that we can actually implement. Uh, now, we can uh, go about doing this. We can turn these informally stated um, properties of an agent into an algorithm that works, at least in the iterated matrix game setting, uh, which we've sort of restricted ourselves to in this talk by modifying um, the one that's given by Powers et al. Uh, and this is uh, what we plan to do next. Uh, essentially, their algorithm is a uh, combination of uh, a bully policy, a maximum policy, and a uh, best response based on fictitious play. And uh, it has various guarantees as described in the paper. It will uh, cooperate in self-play. Uh, it will be optimal against a certain uh, specified class of opponents and or epsilon optimal, and it will be epsilon safe. So payoffs of at least a maximum value minus epsilon against any opponent. Um, and we can modify this algorithm to um, keep the uh, ex exploitation behavior against uh, stationary opponents, keep the safety behavior that is able to play maximum against opponents, but instead uh, converges to a minimum welfare e equilibrium against other agents uh, that are using the same algorithm. So it becomes uncooperative or doesn't cooperate in self-play. Uh, this is then our, in the matrix game setting, our uncooperative benchmark agent. So um, we've now arrived at a sketch of how we intend to measure how much of an agent's performance is due to cooperation, um, at least in this restricted case. What we would do is we would use some social welfare function W over the, the a, a two agents and compare, <coughs> compare the social welfare reached by the um, agent we're testing and the uncooperative agent. Um, I'll also note that we could also look at things other than welfare. We could also compare the individual agent returns between the um, uncooperative and test agents. And obviously on this definition, uh, we need to be careful to choose um, the welfare function, the distribution over environments where we're measuring the agent's performance and the counterpart agents and their behaviors um, in a way that gives us a sort of well-rounded um, model of the age of um, the agent's overall performance. So this is work that was sort of to some degree already started by melting pot. The addition is simply the the uncooperative um, benchmark agent. But then, if we do that, what we would do is average this metric over lots of environments and a good range of counterpart background agents to get a comprehensive measure of the agent's performance and then normalized by the performance of the uncooperative agents. And that way we, we determine how much of the uh, agent's overall performance is due to cooperation. So we can now uh, ask how, assuming we do all that, how does this metric perform at the uh, overall goal that Jesse explained of furthering differential progress on uh, cooperative intelligence? Um, one thing to note, first of all, is that for the agent's cooperative capabilities to register on this metric, they need to at least get a higher social welfare than the uncooperative agent. And if the agents are very incompetent, even if they're highly cooperative, they might fail to do that. So it's really a measure of co um, uh, performance due to cooperation, assuming the performance reaches the baseline level. Um, so uh, as a... Um, as a method addressed at the original goal that we stated, how does this, uh, how could this perform rather? Uh, well, for one, it does require us to know explicitly what the agent's utility functions are, which is all very well when we're talking about melting pot or matrix games, but we certainly don't know this for humans and there's a good chance we won't know it for future advanced AI systems. Uh, and we also need to be able to specify uncooperative agents. And uh, we've seen that it's somewhat challenging even in the restricted setting of matrix games. And this difficulty is just going to grow as we, as the environments get more complex. So uh, there are sort of difficulties that this method would encounter further down the road. Uh, so there are some potential uh, alternative approaches, as I alluded to in my introduction. One potentially better approach, which doesn't require us to assume we know the agent's utility function, is to somehow learn a measure of cooperative intelligence from human feedback. Now, there's been lots of work in uh, areas like reward modeling or inverse reinforcement learning on um, learning uh, reinforcement learning agent behavior from human preferences. And in parallel to that, we might consider using uh, reward modeling 
um, based on human feedback to learn uh, cooperative behavior that humans approve of. Um, this is an approach we're still thinking through, and there's a few open questions about how to go about it. And uh, as I believe was mentioned in the first talk, you know, it, it's been pointed out that we, do, we don't necessarily always want behavior that's human-like. So there's certainly questions to be addressed here as well. But uh, that is uh, for future work. And I'd just like to close by saying that, uh, as Jesse said, that the Cooperative AI Foundation will be putting out, putting out a call for proposals to address these questions around the measurement of an agent's cooperative capabilities. Uh, and uh, we're really interested to see what you all think. And uh, thanks for listening. Great. OK, thank you very much, uh, both Jesse and, and Sammy. Um, and yeah, fantastic talk. Um, I'll now uh, pass over first to Zoe uh, and then to Jose, um, who uh, will be offering their thoughts. And then after that, uh, we'll have time for a little bit of uh, discussion and uh, audience Q&A, I hope, before the end. So, yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Beth. Uh, Lewis, can you just stop me when I'm over my five minutes? Because I'll just keep asking questions. Thanks, so guy, as well, sure for, for those inputs. That was really interesting, I thought. Um, I have a couple of sort of clarification questions and maybe some reframing um, offers. So for the first, you know, the, the big idea of, of saying you're going to focus on differential progress within cooperation. Um, I think this is, a, I would slightly reframe this in that you know, technology is constantly being developed in respect to particular interests that are behind the development um, of those technologies. And in that case, depending on who has more um, financial resources or decision power within uh, the technology development process, there's always differential progress going on, right? So the question really that you're posing is I think whether the kind of interests that you have, which is to build safer AI or aligned AI, are um, having a significant effect on the progress that is happening within AI. So that's just a slight reframing. Because so I think science and technology studies, they have been looking at um, how technology really gets developed for a really long time. And it's, it's never this um, baseline of uh, technology development. And then you can sort of uh, differentially impact that. Um, there's always differential um, a development going on. Um, the second set of questions that I had were sort of around the, they, there seems to be two themes in, in both of your talks. One is that there are a set of sort of internal capabilities of the agent, whether that's human or, or AI, um, that would lead to cooperative choices. And then there are particular environments that have particular structures, such as particular incentives that would incentivize cooperative behavior. Right? And depending on how you're setting this up, I think you're, I'm just confused about what your project is. So if you um, are setting up the environment in a way that makes it rational for the particular agent that you've programmed to behave cooperatively, um, then you're just back with this old alignment problem, which is simply that you have to um, specify the reward function or the, the sort of the, the end goal of, of that agent in the right way so that it ends up being aligned with uh, whatever we want. Um, that is different than the kind of scenarios which I would imagine are the safety scenarios um, where in fact cooperation does not enhance your performance but it hurts your performance, but you're cooperating anyways. So I'm, I'm wanting some, some clarification there if, if that's possible at all. Um, and then, yeah, I would love to have a list over the, the next couple of years of sort of internal uh, characteristics of the agents that would make it more likely that they cooperate. And you mentioned a couple of biases that we see in the human. I think there are also uh, positive biases, right, of those that actually lead us to be more cooperative. And it would be really interesting to have that in a technical setting too. Um, I think I will probably just, oh yeah, the, the one other question um, that I heard is that, this seems to go beyond a minimal definition of alignment, which is to just say, we want those agents to be particularly obedient. If you're looking at cooperation as a way of, in fact, enhancing the welfare of other agents around you, does that already presume a sort of stewardship um, uh, 
uh, version of alignment that actually takes stewardship over the welfare of the individual humans that are around, um, but does not presume that the particular agency of them have to be uh, perfectly respected at all times, right? There is sort of two different uh, ways of looking at alignment. One is you just want to create algorithms that do whatever we want them to do, so perfectly obedient, accepting that sometimes what we want to do is in fact not optimal and uh, does not lead to global welfare. And the other type of alignment, which is uh, I think what you were alluding to, which is a much bigger, I think, goal um, to figure out how it sort of will achieve our preferences that, that are our long run preferences, not necessarily stated, but possibly revealed. Um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm curious what your perspective is on that and what your, what your plan is to go from this more minimal version to the uh, more difficult version. And I guess um, the, I'm sure you've gotten this comment before, but um, the way that you're currently capturing uh, corporate, corporative behavior um, seems to try and want to solve all parts of alignment um, in, in parts because you're setting it up in this, in this very encompassing manner where you're both looking at the environment and the individual agent capabilities. Um, so that, that might be an issue for bounding the kind of uh, speakers you might have. Thanks so much there. Yeah, um, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know if, if I respond now or do we get Jose's comments first, Luis? Um, if there's anything you want to, to, to respond to briefly, do feel, do feel free. But otherwise, I, uh, I suggest that we keep it brief in any case so that uh, we have time for Jose's uh, discussion because I think you absolutely might to, to go to absolutely. Talk, so. Thanks. Yeah, uh, I, I think the brief answer that will hopefully um, partially answer several of those questions is that we are interested in um, kind of making recommendations to self-interested actors. So we don't um, we're, we don't want to convince actors to do things that they don't regard as, as in their interest by you know, making their agents excessively pro-social or something in a way that will make them exploitable. Um, but we do want to <laughs> we do want to help actors do things that are in their interest and in everybody else's interest, as opposed to help them do things that are only in their interest. Um, um, and yeah, so, so I, I think that's maybe maybe a pretty important clarification to make. Um, and uh, the other comments and questions are really really interesting, but um, as Lewis says, I'll, I'll just I'll just leave it at that for for now. I will also mention that we'll have time uh, for discussion after the end of the call for those that uh, have have time to stick around. Um, and I believe both Jesse and Sammy will be there. Um, so if we want to follow up on any of those things, we can. But for now, I'll pass over to Jose. Okay. Uh... Thank you. Uh, this is really interesting. And you know that I uh, completely sympathize with the vision and especially the goals uh, that are a little more detailed at the end about how to measure uh, maybe the contribution, the positive contribution of the cooperative or competitive behavior or the uncooperative behavior. Um, and of course, using tools such as uh, Melting Pot is, uh, uh, yeah, that, that's great. And I'm trying just to get some of my PhD students uh, being able to, to, to work with uh, these systems. They are just struggling just with uh, predator and prey uh, scenarios. And you could uh, write uh, many, many uh, PhDs uh, with just that. So just imagine something like Melting Pot where you have this diversity of, of but, um, I even encourage you to go a little, to be a little bit more radical in terms of, because this is very agent oriented, very individualist. So you're still talking about the capability as one agent, just when it, it starts working in a multi-agent environment. And I always think about this in terms of a collective uh, behavior and collective capability. So this kind of, even this kind of collective in intelligence, which by the way, depends on the capabilities of the individuals and especially the personalities or the attitudes of the individuals when we come from psychology. And that's my, my, my main point here, and maybe for, for discussion is, uh, uh, I don't believe in this orthogonality between capabilities and, and of course being good and bad. Actually, I think that the, the, uh, in many cases, having higher capabilities, this comes with doing more good. And we have seen some, so sometimes incompetence is, is a trigger for doing evil. Uh, that, that's my, my, of course, there's some, 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 that's, that's one thing that might happen in humans, but not in some other animals. 
this is very complicated, as we know, and that's why we need to do more research. Uh, uh, but the thing is, in terms of risk, it's clear that the more powerful a system is, the risk get, uh, get higher. So that's clear. So that's this orthogonality in, in many ways I don't believe in. But the question is, so here you try to, to talk about these harmful capabilities. Uh, and I would argue strongly against this because there's no such a thing as a harmful capability. And it's not because everything has a dual use, as you said. Okay, that's, that's, of course, we agree on that. It's because capabilities, even you can have a very competitive player uh, playing football, and then you have, and maybe out of the game, out of the game, that person is not really competitive in other scenarios, or, or maybe uh, that player would do things in the team that wouldn't do in other situations. So in many cases, being able of doing something in terms of cognitive capability, that's good. That's always good. The question is all the personality, all the attitudes that are uh, associated with that agent. And we can also measure that. And of course, for instance, in humans, we have the, the, the big five, personality, but there's also attitudes. And when we talk about social skills, this is a combination of, for instance, uh, the capabilities of making mind models, but also a set of personality traits that make you more pro-social. But sometimes even these things, when you put these personalities, these personalities can be extremely bad. Uh, maybe you are too extravagant, or maybe you are too reserved, or maybe you are too critical. Even if being critical is good, but that, but being being much too intelligent, that's not, that's not something that can be bad, okay? Uh, of course, in terms of risks, but not in terms of talking about that, this, this is uh, kind of a bad capability. Um, so that, that's a little bit the, my, my main concern about, that probably is terminological. So it's not that it, this affects your, your, uh, your vision and what you're trying to do. It's more a little bit about being a little bit careful. I think perhaps skill is a term that you can use a little bit more softly than perhaps capability. And maybe or when you talk about harmful capability, maybe always add the uh, adjective about potential harmful capabilities because yeah, this idea that maybe a capability is not really harmful. It depends on many other things about how the agent is built. That, that's my main, main thing and maybe of, about clarification. But about the rest, I think, of course, there are many things and many open questions, but I think that this, this is great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot, Jose. So, um, yeah, I think the point about potentially harmful um, capabilities is well taken and in being more careful with terminology there. Um, so, yeah, there were a few points. One was, I mean, there's there was the kind of capability or, or which which you think is kind of neutral rather than um, there are more there are capabilities that are more harmful than others. But then there's the kind of personality or maybe the motivations of the agents that um, that are kind of directing the capabilities in, in good or bad directions. Um, so one thing is that maybe um, maybe I'm imagining these kinds of personality traits or motivations as being lumped in with capabilities, um, and I should be, and we should be more careful about distinguishing between uh, motivation and and personality or whatever its analogs in AI system are, in AI systems are, and and capabilities. Um, so that point is also is also well taken, rather than wrap, wrapping this all up into capability. Um, I do think that. Um, Certain capabilities have greater potential for harm, and I'm not. I, I I would imagine you're not disputing this, right? So, like, I don't know, handing a, a handing a child a, a, a gun is giving them a, a potentially harmful capability, even though it's you know up to up to kind of a matter of their motivation and personality whether they they use it in the way that harms other other people. Um, and I guess that's what we're we're trying to get at here. We're trying to um, push on those capabilities that um, when Combined with maybe the the, the wrong motivations um, or personality traits or or, or whatever um, or uh, um, are uh, tend to lead to more harm than than other capabilities. Um, yeah, so that's that's I think all I uh, the, the main thing I had on those points. Um, yeah, I, um, uh, I I had a couple of things to say. Uh, thanks for 
to both of you for, for your comments. First of all, I think uh, Zoe's point about differential progress is um, very well taken, which is that what we're really talking about, and in fact, what the actual, if we go back to it, what the actual diagram showed is um, not as such differential progress in the sense of uh, there's, a, there's an obvious default, but rather there's two possible paths of progress and both of them are uh, a sort of sequence of uh, some things are emphasized more than others. And the red path is the one that we're currently going on with our current mix of motivations to invest in different things. And what we want to do is the green path. So there's a certain sense in which that's not really differential progress because there's not a default. So I think that, that point is well taken. Um, <clears throat> another point that I think um, uh, is worth going back to is that it's true that what we're, what we're doing with cooperative AI is as Jesse said, we're not trying to do the full like ambitious uh, alignment with all the values of the, the uh, Asian system and solving all AI related problems, understanding of alignment is somehow brought up. Um, but we are trying to do something that is a bit further than the sort of narrow obedience framing that's sometimes used. What we're, what we're trying to do is essentially have agents do things that they selfishly want to do, but do them in ways that sort of don't lead to outcomes that are bad by everyone's rights and the, the prisoner's dilemma is a, a classic example of that and sort of what what exactly that consists of um, um is in in sort of essence sometimes uh you know we have to be careful about defining it because we're not talking about things like making sure that it acts in accordance with a particular like moral view for example so yeah um thanks thanks for those comments Cool, thanks. Um, so I think we, we are about, we're just past the hour now, uh, but we will be sticking around for a little while longer um, after the talk. So I noticed that there are a couple of um, hands up um, and also uh, be good to return to some of some of Zoe's points that we didn't um, have time to talk about before. Um, so just once more, I will say thanks to our speakers, Jesse and Sammy, uh, and also to um, our discussants, uh, Zoe and Jose. Um, and uh, thanks, thanks everyone for attending. Um, and look forward to seeing you at the next seminar. Thanks.